Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you so much uh, for being here again this morning at such short notice. And I know you all had very important things to do at this time. And it's, uh, it's inherently rude of me just to land this um, opportunity in your diary. So thanks for all of the uh, rearranging that you would clearly have done uh, to be here. Um, my name is Jenny Smith and I'm the CEO of Your Homelessness Peak Body in Victoria, the Council to Homeless Persons. Um, if I could uh, not go any further without acknowledging the traditional custodians of all the lands that we're uh, on around Victoria uh, this morning. Uh, I myself am on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and I would like to pay my respects uh, to elders past, elders present, elders emerging and any who we are fortunate enough to have here with us today and acknowledge that uh, none of these lands were ever ceded. Um, this forum uh, is uh, generally supported by a number of people at Homes Victoria uh, with a particular focus on the recent announcement by the Minister about the uh, up to 250 Homes for Families uh, packages, um, which is a very exciting announcement, but we're also going to touch on other things that are on your mind, uh, and we can particularly do that in, in questions. Um, so uh, Nicola Quinn, who's the Deputy CEO of Homes Victoria, will uh, join us for some remarks at uh, some point. Um, we're going to open uh, in a minute with Jacinta Rossi, who's um, Acting uh, Exec Director, Homelessness and Emergency Response to provide a short presentation. And when we get to questions on about things like hotel exits, we'll have uh, with us, you can see Sherry Brunhout, uh, Exec Director of Housing Pathways and Outcomes. And when we get to topics like uh, vaccinations, we also, you can see we have uh, Bell Marsden, Deputy Agency Commander, Operations Readiness, Response and Emergency Management. Um, so if Andrew would kindly get up uh, Jacinta's presentation and share it, good man, I'll um, throw to you, Jacinta. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we are meeting today, the many, many lands, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, we are really excited about um, the announcement um, and um, just wanted to take this opportunity um, to share what we could. Um, obviously, um, please bear with us. We're in the throes of um, trying to uh, design and, um, and, and procure. So there's things that I obviously can't share at this stage. Um, um, and um, just if I recall, a conversation at the uh, CEO's meeting yesterday with H for H2H, -H, I promise it won't be Christmas Eve that we come to you. Um, so, um, Cathy, um, that's, that's kudos to you for making sure I don't do that. Um, okay, so if you could just go to the next slide for me, please. Thank you so much. Um, so as of the 27th of October, there were, um, in, with excluding H2H -H eligible people, there were nearly 2,000 households experiencing homelessness in hotels. Um, and um, what we've done is homelessness agencies have been, have been directed to exit singles and couples over the next 14 weeks. Um, and this is in recognition of the size of cohort and, you know, to support staggered exits. Um, so, and then also, sorry, I'm just flicking slides. Um, so the Homes for Family program um, has largely been based on what we've learnt from H2H, -H, but also um, the Putting Family First initiative. Um, at the time when we put the submission to government, there were nearly 250 households with over 479 children. Um, it's, it's huge. Um, so eligible families must have been in emergency hotel accommodation during the pandemic response prior to and including the 25th of October and must have an eligibility, I suppose, for the VHR. Um, and then families that aren't requiring intensive support and accommodation and have the capacity to rent private, they won't be eligible for homes for families. Um, if you go to the next slide for me, please. 
Now, Homes for Family will provide tailored packages, which are trying to work out what that looks like and what, um, what uh, will, I suppose, based on the needs of families. Um, and what we've learnt from H to H is we, we do need to have a, we need to strengthen the front end assessment. So what we do will be planning to do is a rapid assessment of families in hotels, um, just so that helps us understand from a priority point of view, um, which families might need us more and also um, to help manage some of the fatigue in the communities. Um, so, um, we're looking at we're looking at leveraging H to H learning. So, looking at um, how the consortia were able to bring in the different disciplines and stuff, um, and bring across the many many um, skilled workforces. Um, we'll also want to bring in, I suppose, some extras that we haven't necessarily had as part of H to H, which would be the family services um, um, sort of um, agencies. Um, if you could just go to the next slide for me, please. So this is just a bit of a, a picture for you, I suppose, you know, um, <laughs> if you've got any suggestions how we could make it look better, I'm, I'm more than happy to hear anything. Um, so we're trying to offer a, um, you know, a practical way of um, coordinating the support for these families. Um, it's not focused on the individual, it's focused on the family. So. Um, as you can see, it will be across the whole gamut of, um, of supports that they may or may not have in place yet. Um, so what we need to, what we'll be doing is um, we've agreed that by June, we will have had these house, these families into head lease properties. Um, so we'd look at probably starting say January. Um, Okay, so as I said, we're just firming up our procurement approach. Um, I'd like to be able to tell you more, I really would. Um, um, but at this time, I suppose I'm just focusing on planning and prioritising. Okay, thanks Jenny. If you, you can take the slide down if you like, people can look at each other now. Thanks um, Belle. And I have had, um, like, like Jenny said, we've got, um, we've got Belle here and we've got Sherry here and myself. So please, if you've got any questions, um, encourage them um, there might be some that we need to take on notice just um, in, in light of work that we are doing. Thanks heaps Jacinta. Um, before I uh, throw to questions uh, I just wondered whether um, Sherry whether you wanted to make any remarks. Thanks Jen. Um, I guess just to put in a bit of context so um, you know the additional $66 million in our sector is an awful lot of money to come out um, and be announced. And um, I just, I guess, want to acknowledge that that's come about because of the, the hard work of this sector in both getting the runs on the board with um, how um, superbly uh, COVID has been dealt with, with by the homelessness service sector and keeping everyone safe the rollout of the H2H program and the really strong advocacy of this service system headed up by your peak at CHP, um, that those things coming together make a really compelling argument to Cabinet about being able to get an additional $66 million into the homelessness service system. And I guess from my perspective, having been in the sector for a long time, that, that's a huge investment. So. If you think about what, um, what's been achieved, um, THM, which is a real backbone uh, program of the homelessness service system, there's about 3,700 THM properties. Um, so 3,700 families or, or households that benefit from THM. About 700 of those are managed by um, AOD providers or mental health providers leaving... leaving um, uh, corrections providers and others. So about, about 3,000 THM properties are actually in the homelessness service system proper. So when you consider how much advocacy and um, great uh, work of this sector, the H2H program is 1,845 18, plus another 250 packages for families. When you compare that to 
you know, one of our backbone programs of about 2000 THM properties, you really start to see what a huge investment has been made in the homelessness service system. So I'm just really wanting to call out that that's only been possible because of the really strong evidence-based work of this sector and the strong advocacy that you've done through the peak and, and through others as well. So I did want to call that out. If it feels a bit painful, um, it is because we're growing not in a very incremental way. We're growing at, in a huge step up, which is what we've all been calling for for a very long time. We need more resource. We need more intensive, more packages of housing and support. So we've all been calling for that for a long time. Um, and effectively, we're um, uh, more than doubling, uh, uh, almost doubling what we have in the service system or increasing by an extra 50% what's there. So if it feels a bit painful, it's because it is, um, but it's ultimately, it, it's an amazing achievement. And I really just want to call out the work of the sector in achieving that. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Sherry. And um, thanks, Jacinda, for uh, the presentation, but also I think uh, just to comment on, uh, yep, the sectors. The host muted me, I muted myself. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Keep saying, I'm, oh, I must be the other host that's muted. Um, uh, but also the internal advocacy in government uh, has also been vital, I think, to this sort of outcome and both the joy and pain uh, that it is bringing to us at the moment. So perhaps the, the most sensible thing um, uh, is uh, for questions on Homes for Families announcement in particular now, and then uh, we can move on to a broader set of questions. Uh, and I know in the chat that uh, George Avatney had a question. So maybe George, if you could ask that question, that would be really good. Yes, sure. Um, just wondering whether it's going to be a similar process to the H2H process where you're going to be seeking consortia to come together for the families' packages, or are they going to be packages? So, um, no, probably we would be looking to leverage the current H2H um, consortia arrangements. Um, and I'm just looking through the procurement now. Thanks, George, and uh, thanks, Jacinta. I think there was a question from Diane uh, in one of the regional areas, which seems to have dropped out of my version of the chat. Oh, here we go. Um, it's just that it's more a bit compressed. Yeah, Donna from Sunbury, COBOR. Um, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I'm just um, wondering um, how much involvement from Family Services um, the program will be looking for because um, our service has both um, housing support and family services. So we're just wondering, um, I suppose we're looking at linking the two together. <laughs> yeah, we definitely will be looking at a, at a joined up approach um, and having, I suppose, strengthening this aspect around um, involvement from family services. So yeah. Um, and could I just ask people to put their hands up, uh, you know, the, the hand that's down in the reactions, if you'd like to ask a question, because that's a bit easier to manage than in the chat. Um, but Mandy Baxter, you've got a question. Morning. Is it morning? No, it, yes, it is. Yeah, it's, it's morning. still morning. Friday morning, no, that's special. Yes, <laughs> it is. Uh, given it's 66 mil, uh, will our regional get a Guernsey in terms of... Mandy, it's statewide. Um, obviously, you know, there will be some limitations, though, based on some of the learnings around the market. So, um, yeah, um, but clearly it's statewide. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Mandy. Thanks, Jacinta. Now, there's a question from uh, Jen Weber. Um, Jen, oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Jenny. Uh, for those of us who haven't been involved in the H, -H um, consortia, uh, how do you envisage bringing family services and specialist family services agencies into this um, uh, consortia approach? Particularly when we're working with children and women um, and do, do specialist housing as well, but we haven't been a part of the H2H. And maybe you could expand perhaps a little bit and um, 
for those of us who haven't been involved in HTH, how would that fit and how would we fit into this? And um, for Jen, sorry. Um, it's a, the way the H2H program works at the moment is it's um, it's obviously a housing support lead, um, and then there's a number of agencies as part of that consortia um, who work around the particular needs of the of the client. So there's tenancy support, but then there's also the multidisciplinary wraparound support. So um, I don't see this as 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 something new. This is just about bringing in some more people. Um, from, you know, from that subject matter expertise. Um, and we are working with um, internally within the department with um, the Family Safety Victoria, also um, our um, Child and Families um, Division to make sure that we're getting, I uh, suppose, the information out to everybody um, about what we're doing. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we will need to partner up with those uh, larger agencies and housing specialists um, in terms of the family services specialisation to be part of that? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, what we'll need to do is come up with how that's going to work in practice because mm. obviously with only 250 packages, I mean, it's, mm. it's, not, it's, not a, it's not as huge as the 1845 that we had with H2H. So it, may, it, it would likely that we'll have to be more targeted about how we do it. So um, we'll come out with some more information on that though. When, when do you see the timeline being for more information coming out? Uh, so we are planning to do a, a rapid needs assessment over the next four weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what I'd want to make sure is, uh, you know, I need that information in order to help me plan and prioritise the areas because um, the initial uh, phase will probably be, I think it's the, up to 150 and we have 100 in contingency. So I just want to make sure that we're really targeted about um, you know, um, supporting agencies where there's fatigue in, in some of the hotels and stuff. But, yeah, so probably within the next few weeks. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jen. If I could, thanks, um, Jacinta, and if I could just um, emphasise that we are appreciative of the department coming forward at this point to talk about where they are up to rather than um, and acknowledging that they really haven't had time to be uh, completely... Uh, finished in their plans about all of this. Now, I think the next question is from my colleague, uh, Cassandra Caroni, and it would be for Jacinta and probably for Sherry as well. So Cass, would you ask your question? You're on mute though, so you're making me look good. <laughs> um, sorry, I was having some problems with my internet, so I was trying to keep my camera off. Um, Wondering if there's been some consideration about employing peer support workers for this initiative, as with the H2H. Um, Thanks. I think that was part of yeah. I think that was part of our submission to government, so it's not dissimilar to H2H. Um, I can come back to you on that, though, Cassandra. Thank you. We'll be very encouraging about that, I suppose, is what we. We might yeah. say. I might just jump in as well. Yeah. So Cass, um, the so the I guess the structure of what of um, how we're managing H two H and the the new program is that um, Jacinta's heading up the program approach, but still the the policy strategy for homelessness is still sitting with me. Um, so Cass, I just want to absolutely assure you that the ongoing uh, in terms of our policy position and strategy for homelessness services. Um, the role of people with a lived experience and peer support is a really central part of where we're looking to move forward in our homelessness service system. So um, I know that H2H had a, um, we, we wrote that in as, a, as an important element. Um, we will continue to, to make sure that that's a really important um, foundation of the work that we're doing into the future. Well, that's great. And I, I, just, I just want to quickly make the point too, I, I was at the... Um... The vision conference yesterday is for so for people who don't know that's the Victorian Indigenous Statewide Homelessness Network, <clears throat> and there's a there was a lot of um, enthusiasm about getting peer support workers who are Aboriginal working in those services. So um, I think it would be great to be turning some attention there as well. Yes, isn't it great where our sectors come to, like in yeah. such a relatively short period of time, that this is just an expected way of how we work. So, yeah, it's a great achievement for all involved, including your good self. 
Well, Please, Sherry. no one's nagged more than Kaz, I think you would have to say, over the years. To great effect, look at the impact she's had on me. Um, thank you, Sherry, as well. Um, Hazel um, from Nurnda, um, you're the next question and you're on mute as well. Thank That's you. okay. So thanks very much, Jenny. I suppose my uh, question, we've had experience with the H2H program and we've had a number of clients go through that program who still aren't housed. They've got the packages, um, but they're still waiting on housing. So has, has there been housing, and this is a fantastic opportunity for families, but has there been housing identified that is available for the H2F program or will you be looking at building those and I th and the other question is is how are you going to guarantee an equitable allocation between metro and rural um so if i just i'll answer the second question first and then go back to the first question so based on what we're basing our um our targeting i suppose is on on families currently in hotels so as i'd said at the start in the presentation at the time of uh, reporting, we had um, over, I think it was 236 families in hotels. Um, and the pack, and so reasonably we would say that if we've got up to 250 packages, um, that we'd be able to cover that cohort. But we're recognising that that number fluctuates a little bit. Um, and sometimes there's more, sometimes there'll be less. Um, and which is why I have asked for more information from our agencies just to help me prioritise and plan around that. Um, yeah. Um, now, the first question, sorry, was just around housing availability. So the target is head lease property. So we, we won't be building new properties. This will be a two year lease as similar to that of H2H. -H. I suppose yeah, I have to be really, um, um, honest at this stage that where we where we've really struggled to find properties from a head lease point of view would be no surprise to any of you which is in our rural air in our rural and regional areas such as Gippsland, Barwon and Bendigo. Um, I, you know people will be eligible but we will be asking them to, um, to move to places where we can get properties. We just can't I just can't make properties appear where they haven't been. Um, the big build will be able to help with that later on, but that's quite a way away. I'd thank you, thank you thank for your for your honesty there, Jacinta, about the situation. I think everybody has some appreciation of what's happened in terms of um, population migration. Um, now, Peter McGrath hasn't put his hand up, but he has got a question just clarifying um, how we're seeing the existing um, uh, consortia. Um, so, Peter, would you like to just make sure that you're clear about that? Uh, yes, Jenny, and, and sorry, I've got my camera off because uh, IT is not always working great where I am at the moment. Um, it was just more of a question, just sent to you talk about leveraging off the current H2H providers. Um, so is it those consortiums will be seen as priority for these packages or can new consortiums um, be considered for this? Thanks, Peter. Listen, I, you know, it, it's timing and I really think it's important not to try and, um, you know, recreate something, especially with the very limited time that we have to find families' homes. So we will be leveraging off the current consortia. However, we will be asking for where there's um, more SME required in certain areas. We will be asking for them to leverage that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so Austin, you're next. Um, if you're still there, great. Yeah. Hey, uh, so you mentioned in the presentation and also when Hazel asked her question about um, the properties and you mentioned head leases. Um, is there gonna be any other kind of properties in the packages such as Office of Housing? And also if it is only head leases, is there a plan at the end of the head lease as to what happens to these families? And uh, yeah, like these are not very similar questions to what we've got in H2H, are they? Um, so no, it'll only be uh, head lease properties um, and um, we don't have an exit strategy at the moment for the, the two year mark. Um, and take on board that we're, we're still trying to work through the exit strategy for the eight, 871 that we have going into head leases for H2H. 
But I guess I can comment, Austin, obviously that's a challenge for us. That's a sort of government approach to funding and then the challenge is for us to make sure that that's ongoing or extended until it's ongoing. Um, that's a very, very good point. Thanks. Um, now, as I always say, it is a delight to ask Jenny Smith from Uniting to ask her question. Thanks, Jenny. Um, and look, from a, a service provider, it's wonderful that um, we've got this $66 million commitment to, you know, housing families. I think a lot of advocacy from the sector um, has really highlighted the, the complex needs. And um, so, yeah, thank you, um, you know, for the wonderful, um, you know, funding announcement. Um, obviously, we're a H2H -H provider, so we're certainly aware of the complexity that comes with this um, cohort. Um, and just into obviously over the next four weeks, there will obviously be some intensive um, and rapid needs assessments being done. But I think of a concern that we've identified in the East for us is the complexity of the families that are there. Um, is there actually going to be appropriate additional staffing component within this um, you know, funding package? Um, obviously, we've got um, the H2H -H staffing requirements with the package types. Um, is it going to be somewhat prescriptive there? Because I think we're also concerned about the complexity of the cohort in motels now as we speak. Several, there are lots of families that have been there for a significant period of time and we're rapidly approaching Christmas and New Year where they will probably still be in motels. So what is the short-term support that will be on offer, I suppose, um, you know, for the families as we work towards a broader rollout of um, H to families, as you said, probably around January? Thanks, Jen. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, listen, I'm still working through the procurement and, 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 and what the budget looks like, but the packages will be different to, than to H2H to H because, you know, in consideration of the complexity of this particular cohort, so it won't, it won't be, it won't look too similar, but it won't be too dissimilar. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're still working through that. Sorry, Jen. Jen. Yeah, and I think we also just need to be mindful if we're going to be attracting new staff. That was one of the learnings from H to H was actually it's a tired and fatigued workforce and um, attracting new um, staff with the right level of experience to be supporting is also, you know, I think an ongoing challenge for us as well. Indeed. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Now, I'm going to go to Marty and then to Mady and then to Hazel and then to Jocelyn, just so everybody knows that they're coming up. So, um, Marty, can we hear from you, your question that you've put in the chat? Hi. Um, look, I guess I'm just wondering about um, families that we're currently um, supporting in motels and how do we identify if they're going to be a, a potential um, H4F um, referral? And are the entry points actually going to be keeping those families? Like, are they identifying them or how do we keep those rolling over until this is all set up? Yeah, thanks, Marty. So, um, so based on who the entry points had identified, like families that were currently in hotels at that time that we, we put the submission in, um, you know, I do, I had sent out an email early this week to our entry points to, just to get a little bit more information on these families um, and um, and their eligibility. Um, so I'm, I'm expecting to get some information back from agencies early next week. So that eligibility has already been set? Yep. And they're going to identify that way. Okay, and do you know if the, um, the VHR emergency management, um, that's going to be the same as the H2H stuff? Yep. So we could be doing that in the meantime to get them set up to, yeah, okay. All right, thank you. Good on you, Marty. Um, can I go to Mady Graham now? Yes, thanks, Jenny. And um, look, terrific to have this extra funding. Always great to get extra money, um, you know, for, for any of our cohorts, but great for the families. Just mindful, I guess, given the plan is to use head leasing properties that we have a number of families with very high support needs who I doubt will manage in head leasing properties very well. I, I suspect there'll be all sorts of issues with the managing there and also concerned about how long support will be provided to them. Um, so obviously at some point our 
the support workers will be providing will end and they may be still partway through that lease. Um, yeah, just conscious of, of we, we don't want, you know, their housing to collapse, to end, etc. So just want to flag that because we've got some really high needs families in motel. Like, and, and of course, their needs have got greater because of the length of time they've been in motel. Yeah, so Thank just you. want to flag that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Modi. Um, we've got Hazel next. Is Hazel still there? Yeah, sorry. I forgot to take me at all. So my question's in regards to families that we put up into a head lease um, for two years. Are they going to be prioritised for other, for more permanent housing after that? Because, you know, I know it sounds fa fantastic to give them, get them accommodation for two years, but I think it's cruel if at the end of two years we don't have a strategy to move them into long-term accommodation. Yeah, I agree with you, Hazel. Um, and, and I think that's similar to the earlier question um, from Haven Home Safe, that, yeah, we need an extra strategy and that's definitely what we'd be working on. Um, and something, I suppose, as part of the design of the program, I really want this to be a co-design. So I will be reaching out to a number of agencies to say, help me out here. Let's design this together so that it um, so that it meets or so, you know, we can manage some of that um, expectations of what we can do and can't do. But thanks, Hazel. Jocelyn, um, Jocelyn's going to change tack a little bit here, but mm -hmm. thanks to have, um, to have you with us. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. And, and I'm sorry, I'm, I was late coming in and missed half of what you've been saying. So um, sorry for that. Um, this is part comment, part, part question. You know, one of the holy grails of you know, head leasing and homelessness is that link to employment with the prospect of maybe households being able to take on their own employment. And um, I, I will happily admit that I've been surprised that we've been successful in getting women off all benefits and into employment, sorry, into employment off all benefits and securely housed. I actually didn't think it was possible and it has been. So how might we use this opportunity and the brand new um, highly sort of extensive employment network through Jobs Victoria, how might we match some of these housing outcomes to employment, I guess? Great point. Um, I probably I'll take that one on notice, but um, yeah, that's it's really interesting. Yes. Thanks for raising that, Jocelyn. That's um, something we need to be thinking about with all of these new opportunities. Try and do better with that connection. Um, I'm I'm smiling at uh, Kate Colvin's plug for the CHP um, uh, State Biennial Conference in the chat. Read that closely and. Um, Kate has led uh, the programming to be uh, right on point to what we're talking about today, as well as other things. And it does look like we're going to be able to have a face-to-face -face drink so um, together. So um, do uh, get on board. Um, Paul Turton's uh, got a question next in the chat. Oh, thanks, Jenny. Uh, look, I, uh, sorry, I've got my video off as well. Uh, look, really, it's around uh, novating leases in head lease program. So. Um, it's really the problem at the two year mark and how we help uh, families to afford rentals. And um, so that's always where we hit, hit the snag and it's either we can put support up front to help them uh, uh, develop the capacity to pay the rental or whether there's a pathway to social housing. So I think we just keep hitting a snag at the two year mark with uh, novating uh, head leasing properties. It seems to be a consistent problem. Is it, I know we've already spoken about it, but is there anything else, Jacinta, you might want to add to that? Uh, no, I, I agree, Paul. <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely a challenge. And, um, but, you know, obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's on us as well that if we can, one, you know, you guys are working so hard to find um, private rental, but if, um, if we've got some social housing properties too, we can look at that. Um, and I'll throw to Sherry in a moment, but, um, you know, it's where we where we can move these people to private rentals that where they can afford them. I think that's really important. Um, but also, what's the support that we need to keep providing them so that they can sustain those tenancies? Um, so, Sherry, would you mind jumping in there for me? 
Yeah, yeah, and what you're saying is is totally correct, Jacinta. I'm not I'm I'm not disagreeing with any of that. But I also just want to really double down and remind people that we have created the um, emergency category in the VHR. So this is for people who have been housed in um, in uh, hotels and have then received a housing first um, package. It's a brand new way that we've really flipped around our management of the Victorian Housing Register to make um, clients of H2H and now H4F um, eligible for the very highest um, category of the VHR. So I, I, I can hear in the sector everyone's very nervous, as you damn well should be, about well, what happens in two years' time um, and the use of head leasing. But I really just want to strongly remind people that um, really skyrocketing these clients to the top of the VHR has other implications, I know, and you're well aware of that, but it gives a real chance to wrap around that support and gives the department a couple of years to really get our act together to be able to source where it's appropriate people into long-term social housing. But I also take on Joss's point that, um, you know, where the pathway to long-term social housing is a good option for clients, that's exactly where they should be. And we've really rewritten our policies to make that easy for these programs. But where people should be going into um, the, the, the market and um, engaging in employment and education where that's their life aspiration, this is the kind of program that can help them with a couple of years to really um, achieve their own goals and then take over leases where that's appropriate. So I just wanted to really remind people that we've rewritten our whole operating policy into the VHR in order to um, uh, give priority to these to these programs for social housing allocation. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Sherry. Uh, um, Kevin, Kevin H in the chats talked about the particular challenge with um, large families. Kevin, did you want to just oh, fill out your sorry, question? I'm not on camera, my apologies. It wasn't a question, Jenny, so much as a comment that we really recognise in the South. Um, we have very large families, six, seven and eights, not uncommon, um, and having to accommodate and support those people, including with um, the COVID positive. And that's, that's going to be a real challenge, particularly with people who won't move out of their local communities because of the supports, because of their um, their cultural connections. So, so simply saying, well, look, we can find a property somewhere else in the area. I think it's a in those families. And it's just a flag my concern that we could see extended stays for larger families pending um, finding those suitable properties for them in a tight market. Yes, I don't think you're alone in the South with that either. But thank you for... I'm uh, happy to talk to the South, too. Yeah, <laughs> drawing attention to that. Yeah. Um, we might go to Loretta from the Salvation Army for next. Thank you. Just lower my hand. I just Good wanted to raise too that probably 90% of the families or 95% of the families we've got in EA are experiencing family violence. So I'm just want to flag is there any intersection between you know family violence and homelessness in these, you know, you know the new program that's coming out. Yes, you're a mother. You, uh, I am, I'm a kindred soul there, Loretta. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, definitely part of the integrated and the, the you know, the interdisciplinary approach will, to have family violence. And that's why we have made sure, I suppose, even within the department that we're reaching into our family safety, Victoria, just to, you know, make sure that we've got those strong connections um, with services. So, yeah, agree totally. Thanks, Jacinta. And um, we've got an observation from Annette Kelly Edgerton in the chat about um, uh, the employment for parents and education and early learning for children will be great uh, inclusions or connections with the integrated interdisciplinary team. Um, before we go to Rob, um, Matilda, I think you've got a question in there with, um, with your comment. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I suppose um, so I'm from the VPTA and I suppose um, from our point of view, we um, we assisted a number of families with the, the tower or supported um, families through the tower relocation program, which is around this time last year. 
Um, and a lot of these larger families that were in the towers, they didn't end up getting um, into head lease properties just because there just weren't a lot of head lease properties available. Um, and I think initially there was about 400 families that were eligible for the program and about 200 or ish um, were moved into these head leases. But some families um, uh, declined the opportunity to move just because the properties weren't there or they just weren't in locations that suited their family's needs. So, yeah, it's just sort of flagging. It's a fantastic announcement, but it, it is a concern. Um, yeah, do we have the properties available? So I might um, just quickly respond to that, Matilda. You're absolutely right. Um, and uh, that it is, we're, we're really conscious also that we don't want, to, as the department, we don't want to have a negative impact on the market. So if we come in and take on, you know, all the larger properties in a market, it has a, it has a knock on impact to pricing and availability in the market as well. So we're really conscious about that. And I guess the other thing that, um, that I would say in that, um, that relocation um, uh, program as well, we actually found we had to just purchase properties in, you know, four or five bedroom properties as well as part of the big housing bill, just because of the, um, of the availability in the market. So I think um, my, my key message is that as the department, um, we are really aware of the scarcity of stock, but we are looking at different ways that we can respond to that as well. So in some areas, we've had to just purchase stock that we thought we might be head leasing um, just because there wasn't the, there were, either wasn't the availability in the market or we were reluctant to have an impact on the market that could have been detrimental to other people. So look, we'll, we'll come at this through, um, we'll, we'll be mindful of all of those impacts that the department and um, unintended consequences that the department can have. And we will really come at this through a, a very um, flexible way so that we can try and get the best we can for the, for the clients in the program and also not drive uh, demand at the access points at the same time. So I think, the, you know, we've shown a lot of flexibility in being able to re respond in a way that keeps all of that in mind. But Matilda, you're absolutely right. That's a, a big program and very challenging when you're, when you're looking for hundreds of, you know, four, five, six bedroom stock. Thanks, Matilda. Thanks, Sherry and Jacinta. Um, I might, uh, Susie Lucas has got a um, camera on, but not a hand up, but she has got a question in the chat. So over to you, Susie, and then we'll go to Rob. Thanks very much, Jenny. Uh, just wondering about, um, and apologies, I missed the beginning if this has been addressed, but the, uh, if there's any uh, increased resourcing and, and I guess targeting of supports for the, the complex needs of children in the high needs families particularly, um, but more broadly as well. Thanks, Susie. So yeah, we definitely will be making that as part of the, considering that as part of the model. Um, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, and the connections, I suppose, to try and deliver that from the broader system. Um, so Rob, what was your question? Um, good morning, all. I think it's an excellent new program. Um, so just quickly, Unison has assisted almost 300 families in crisis in the Western in Wyndham during the pandemic. Uh, so a significant number have been housed in the private rentals, some in transitional housing. My question is that um, some are flat couch surfing and in and in insecure housing. Um, are any of this group eligible for the new program? So, Rob, um, let me let me probably work through some of that. Um, and so, are you referring, say, maybe to people in current in THM properties, for instance? Uh, no. Well, I mean, there are some in THMs, but there's also a group that have left emergency accommodation, and sort of account surfing and perhaps sharing with other families and in and in insecure housing. It's not the easiest thing to say. Yeah. So, it was just to ask whether any of that group that we've assisted during the pandemic are eligible. We would say definitely would be, and that's how we approach H to H. Um, but you know, this is where I have to go through a process, I suppose, of um, prioritising um, our cohort because, yeah, I'd, I'd like listen. I'd love to give it to everyone, but 250 packages. Um, so please let us know about those people so we can capture them as early as possible and um, prioritise. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, there's a question there from Robin O'Connor, which I think. Um, 
goes to some of the housing supply, social housing and affordable housing supply that's been mentioned. So Robin, I hope you feel that, that you've had an answer there. Um, Jen Fox, you wanted to change tack a little bit. Yes, I did. So um, I've just questioned about HEF funding. Um, obviously that's been significantly impacted by um, the lockdown requirements and um, providing hotel accommodation. During lockdown, we've also got H2H clients still in hotels, which um, you know significantly impacts our HEF um, budget, but also now continuing to fund families until January. Is there any additional HEF funding coming our way or reimbursement for particular cohorts or clients? Yeah, good question, Jen. And I reckon that's the question on a lot of people's minds as well. I'm looking at you, Rob, and, and Salvos and Launch and others. Um, so yes, part of the 66 mil also includes additional uh, HEF to not only keep the, the families who will be part of this program um, stable, as stable as you can be in a hotel, but in a hotel until we can exit them. Um, at, in the same way that H2H funding keeps people in hotels until we can exit them into the, the housing that's right for them. Um, there is also um, uh, some additional funds for uh, to do a staged uh, wind down of the emergency hotel program. Uh, so the people who are in hotels who perhaps won't be eligible for either H2H or the H4S program. Um, and, and being able to uh, do that in a more, that sort of wind down in a more controlled way. So uh, we're just doing the formulas at the moment in order to give access points uh, some forward planning onto what the De uh, December allocation will look like, January um, and then February, so that you can start to wind down that program. In addition, we're also uh, looking to release some additional IAP slash IR type responses because obviously when we start communicating to uh, people in hotels that we will be um, finishing this program, there'll be um, some people that'll be reaching out for some assistance in planning uh, their exits through there. So that was some, um, so we're working that through at the moment. We'll have that out to agencies by um, by the end of next week of what that those um, funding uh, funding allocations start to look like. Um, in addition to that, um, what have I got? I've got 15 agencies that are currently reporting arrears. So for the access points and others who are reporting on a weekly basis on your HEF spend, it's really important to keep going. I'll note that um, last week we had 11 providers that didn't report. Makes it really hard for me to um, determine what the funding looks like and um, what, how deeply I need to be digging um, if you're not reporting. So last week, I know that 15 agencies reported that they're in rears. We will, we will take that into consideration if you're in arrears when we're looking um, to the forward um, allocations as well. So just to stress really important work. Um, the other thing that we're doing um, is we've sent out a request uh, to access points this week for the SLK details of people in hotels because we are aware that, um, you know, 1845 packages for, um, for people in hotels and 250 packages for families is awesome and amazing and, and you know, we're really pleased about that. But that doesn't mean um, it's not the silver bullet to end homelessness and that there will be people in hotels who are going to really um, be challenged for an exit strategy um, as, as we wind down that program. So I'm really keen uh, that we have data that we can start making an argument of well, what happens to people who leave hotels without a package um, and being able to unidentifiably, but to um, follow people's service usage um, over time so that I can start, well, sorry, I, the team, all of us can start to make arguments about what the positive impact of housing and support can be and what actually happens when um, perhaps a limited offering is made um, for the other people in hotels that, that um, won't be eligible for some of these programs. So I'm really asking for your help to help us with some of that data request that's just gone out, I think, yesterday. 
um, and good for you to understand what we intend to do with that data. Thanks, Sherry. Thank Appreciate you. it. Now I'm going to. Um, uh, there's a question from Meredith Gorman and Jenny Smith Uniting's got her hand up. I'm going to leave the questions on homes for families with those two, and just maybe hope Bill Marsden's still there for maybe a few comments about vaccinations before we close. So, Meredith. Yeah, Jacinta, are you um, in a position to tell us about the allocations process for H? What are we calling it? H2F. Um, are you thinking of a centralised um, allocation process or a regional um, allocation process like we did for um, H2H? Oh, so Jacinta's coined the term H4F. 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 Um, yeah, and I think Nicholas said yesterday, if it doesn't work, everyone's going to blame it on yeah, me. Yeah, it's your <laughs> fault, Jacinta, that's right. <laughs> it took us this long to get used to H2H. So, yeah, H4F. Um, no, so, um, yeah, bear with us. I still haven't um, sort of worked through that process yet, um, Meredith. So, thanks. Good question. Okay. okay. And Jenny Smith, just the last word on this topic, and we'll see about Yeah, thanks, Jen. Jacinta, my question was just a point of clarity. When we're looking at... Um, the um, head leased component of um, H to F, um, that responsibility will be like H to H and the procurement process will probably sit with community partners. Is that the expectation? Um, yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> two, two, two yeses, um, which is great. Um, so, um, Belle, are you still there? I am. Hi, Jenny, how are you going? Great, thanks so much for being with us this morning. I wonder if there haven't been questions about the vaccination and all that, but I wonder if you've got any updates from your area that would be useful for us to have a perspective on. Yeah, certainly. Look, um, the C19 team, so your lead providers have been out um, and running um, a vaccination program across many of the dedicated homeless hotel settings. Uh, as of yesterday, I've got uh, an update that they visited, um, have visited 77 hotels um, and done some education and communication activities along with some vaccinations. We've got nearly 250 um, vaccinations administered. Um, we're looking um, at pulling some data together to give us, I guess, a better indication about first dose versus second doses um, and where we might um, move to next. Um, C19 are looking at establishing a mobile vaccination unit um, and looking to where we might be able to co-locate it um, with existing you know, homeless service providers. So I don't know if um, C19 teams have been in touch, but I certainly think that there'll be some partnership work uh, happening in the, the next phase. So um, um, look out for that and if you have interest in um, you know, a, a client cohort or um, a, a project, then I think um, please um, let let me know um, and uh, I can help connect uh, connect up the dots. The other thing I'd say in the vaccination space as well is, is that there's been a call for submissions for some projects um, up to $20,000, um, looking at priority community cohorts. So it's not vaccinations themselves, but it's about how we can um, dispel some of the, the myths about vaccination, how we can educate um, and how we can better target um, people who might be, you know, resistant to um, to wanting to get vaccinated. It's probably a, a that's wrap great, Val. That's great, and um, I think the tone of that is the extended commitment to trying to access, access uh, the vulnerable people about whom we have concern and take take the time it's going to take, which is more time than often is usual, um, to engage with them around being fully vaccinated. So. Thank you very much. Um, are there any, if you put your hand up, um, I'll, we've got time for a question or two for Belle. Tanya, that'd be great. Morning, everyone. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I had a question about rapid antigen testing and whether or not there's availability for the sector and how that might be used with both clients and staff. Yeah, thanks, Tanya. I can answer this in that, you know, the rapid antigen testing is is relatively new. Um, and what I can say is, is that we're, we're undertaking a small trial at the moment um, in a number of what I would call um, uh, at-risk settings that, that we would identify. One of those it would be a homeless hotel setting. So 
we've got like a little group together um, and we are looking to, you know, like I say, do a bit of a pilot um, and to pilot approach with clients and staff um, to see how, how that might work. Um, that That is, that was the meeting actually I was in before um, I came in here. That that work is, is happening and is underway now. So we'll use the pilot to help inform what we might do, be able to do in a, a much bigger longer term um, setting. What I'd say right now too about rapid antigen testing is there's a lot of curiosity and a lot of um, um, interest. There's also um, a limited number of tests that really are available. So, you know, it is an emerging space. So, you know, wanting to do it in a larger scale even probably isn't going to be um, it isn't going to be possible until we get a few more people um, in the mix to uh, to put them together and make them deployable. We have to make more, do we, Bill? We've got to make more, a lot We've more. We've got to make more, a great more. All right. Um, and uh, Paul's mentioned that uh, Instant Care's trialling one of them at the minute, which is great. Look, we have run out of time. Um, again, thank you all for being here. Um, and asking such incisive and useful questions in a very constructive way. And uh, so I think the sector's heartfelt thanks to you, Jacinta, for um, uh, leading off today and uh, the support that you had uh, from Sherry um, and also Belle uh, for hanging in there for the whole uh, session. Um, Homes Victoria is being very responsive in terms of having these for her. So if you think we need one, uh, let me know and uh, and we'll, I'll certainly uh, approach if I get the sense that that's a, a shared uh, view out there. Very willing indeed. Um, but thank you again for your flexibility and uh, look, we go on an ever extending and uh, <laughs> increasingly resource rich and uh, complex, exhausting uh, journey. So um, let's hang in there as uh, we wish the year was winding down, but it, it clearly isn't. But it's it's very reassuring, Jacinta, that there won't be a tender uh, anywhere near Christmas, either before or after. Very reassuring. Okay, everybody, we'll stay in touch and uh, see you soon. Good on you.